<laughs> okay. You know, hard to make this final video. It's gonna be okay. Take it easy, right? It's gonna be the last video. I'm just not gonna, not gonna get all worked up about things. All right. Let's just sum up what we've learned. Way back in lecture one, hey, remember that? It was the beginning, right? Like my hair was shorter. It was, you know, still COVID cut. But you know, what are you gonna do? Way back in lecture one, we learned about, you know, what is economics? We learned that the economy is something that we remake every day, right? It's it's us, right? We built it. We made it the way it is. You don't like it, change it, okay? Um, it's not the weather. We learned that, you know, the economy is a reflection of our abilities and our preferences. You know, there's things that we can't have because we, we just don't know how to do those things. We can't have anti-gravity machines. We can't have teleporters because we don't have that technology. But the things that's technology technologically possible, we can we can do that if we want, right? As society. Finally, we learned that that economic growth is a <laughs> not a bot. <laughs> it's about productivity, right? So how you know how do we get those things that we can't technologically make? Well, we have to learn how to be, become more productive. We have to invest and we have to learn better ways to do things. This is what we learned in lecture one. In lecture two, we started to learn about some of the data that economists use. You know, where is this data? Where does it come from? What does it look like? How do I access it? Okay, it's not something just for professional economists. It's free, right? Well, the United States is free, and most developing countries have reasonably good free economic data. Certainly, economic data is plenty good enough for you to do a rudimentary economic analysis and to be a very well-informed citizen. In lecture three, we learned about real versus nominal activity. Real activity, of course, is the stuff, right, that we make with an economy. That's real economic output. We learned about nominal. This is the dollar values of the things we produced. We learned about how those two ideas are connected in economic thought. We learned how to, that is, we learned how to construct price indices and how to measure inflation. Measuring inflation is a way of trying to connect the nominal with the real, right? Because we observe nominal values, but we care about real values. Okay, we learned about the reasons and types of unemployment. We learned that different types of unemployment have different causes and consequently different solutions. We learned about gross domestic product, what it is, what it measures, what it doesn't measure. Then when we got to lecture four, we started talking, we, we, we sort of went way backwards, right? To the very beginning of, of sort of economic thinking and and thought about super rudimentary economic concepts, production, supply, right, demand, and consumption, and markets. And we started to think about how we could develop a model to think about these things in a systematic way. Then in lecture five, we did that, right? We started to develop simple economic models based upon even simpler behavioral assumptions, right? Remember that, that everything we did in this class was based upon these very, very simple behavioral assumptions, nothing radical or crazy. And from those very simple understandings, we were able to develop really pretty sophisticated models that certainly allowed us to understand a whole lot about how the macroeconomy works. In that next lecture, we then focused in tightly on households, you know, how household spending patterns impact the macroeconomy. So our, of course, we're earning incomes but when are we spending those incomes? Because of course, our incomes, our business costs, and our spending is business revenues. So it matters, right? It matters, our spending patterns matter. We learned about the relationship of savings to investment. We learned about different types of incomes and how that matters. We learned some things about demographics and household incomes. Moving on to lecture seven, we shifted to business. We talked about the decision, business decision to invest, right? And we already know we just learned in the last lecture, in lecture six, about households and savings. But you know, why do businesses invest? Why is that an important decision for them? Uh, why is it a risky decision? And then what is the relationship between their willingness to make that decision and, and households? As we learned, you know, of course, for households to save, businesses have to be willing to invest. Uh, and so we learned about that sort of very important problems. You know, business, of course, doesn't need to invest, right? Business owners don't need to expand their business. They could just take their money and stick it in the stock market or whatever, like a lot of people do, you know, plan for their own retirement. Okay, so, you know, why, why run a business? It's a, it's a risky thing. In lecture eight, then we shifted to the financial sector. We talked about money, you know, why money has value, particularly fiat money. Um, we learned about the function of the financial sector. The function of the financial sector, of course, is to provide the liquidity necessary to fund you know, good economic ideas. 
uh, we learned that the money supply is flexible and the reason why it's flexible is because we don't want to be constrained by the quantity of money in the economy uh, we'd rather be constrained by the um, number of good ideas in the economy in lecture 9 we continued this talk discussion of the financial sector learned about how a fractional reserve system works about sort of fundamentally unstable nature uh, we learned about banking and particularly central banking and how central banking stabilizes the sort of instability of a flexible financial system. And in doing so, we learned about monetary policy, how the central bank can adjust interest rates to impact, uh, of course, financial sector activities, uh, as well as to encourage or discourage household and business sector activities. In lecture 10, we focused our attention on government. We learned about how, again, as I've said, said at the beginning of this lecture, how government creates the rules that the economy is founded on. So all, all the things that we do, all the economic activity, of course, is founded upon the, the rules set by the government. We also learned about how changes in government activity, particularly taxation and spending, impacts households and businesses. Increasing government spending creates business revenues. Decreasing taxes increases household spendable income, okay, and the reverse also. And so decreasing government spending cuts into business revenues, right, and increasing taxes cuts into household disposable income. All of this, this sort of policy designed to engineer the macroeconomy is referred to as fiscal policy when it's taxation or spending policy. In chapter 11, in lecture 11, which was really the last of the new material for the course, we learned about the foreign sector. We learned about why the foreign sector is special and separate, generally separated off because of course we're dealing with multiple currencies and that creates some reasonably significant accounting problems because the same nominal stuff that we're generally observing is different nominal stuff now. Uh, but we learned how to account for that and then we learned about trade deficit surpluses, you know, what they really mean. And we learned about you know, why capital moves around the world, why people invest here versus invest there, and then how that impacts exchange rates as well as uh, plays into uh, trade deficits and trade surpluses. Excuse me. In that very last lecture, um, we now have a grounding in macroeconomic ideas, and we reviewed some of the data. In particular, we reviewed the data with an eye towards understanding and evaluating how the macroeconomy has been managed in the last 70 to 80 years. When we look at the data with this understanding, it becomes very clear, very clear that the macroeconomy is not sort of weather, right? It doesn't just, storms don't come and go, and it doesn't snow on one day and rain on the other. Um, it's a managed process, and it's managed with intent. Um, So as a consequence, this means, you know, we can make it what we want. Um, but we have to have an idea, one, about how it works. And we have to have some ideas about how we accomplish those things. Okay. So, you know, that's it. I've said my piece for this course. I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope you've learned a few things. <laughs> hopefully, I put this at the end to hopefully remind you of what you what you learned. And, and, and I hope I've accomplished that. All right. Uh, have a good future, everybody. Stop and say hi sometime. Let me know how you're doing. All right. Take care. Bye.